Uh, we're going to go ahead and measure a uh, gunpowder particle. This is a Winchester Super Target double A smokeless ball powder. Uh, I've tried to grab a particle of this with some forceps, and we're going to go ahead and stick it in front of the dart. The dart's back under uh, fairly standard conditions. We've uh, got a lower gas temperature right now. It's about 200 degrees, and we're back in positive ion mode, uh, not doing anything particularly tricky here. Go ahead and open up a data file. And let's give it a file name. The hard part's grabbing the gunpowder particle. And let's go ahead and open the data file. As soon as that comes up, if we can keep a grip on the particle, we should see some peaks show up in the in the dart. It helps to have really fine forceps to grab these uh, small particles. I'm trying to get a uh, window here so I can see what's going on. Let's there we go. Here's the uh, spectrum. Okay, let's see if we can get this in front of the dart without dropping it. Get a better grip on it. There we go. We've got some peaks from it. So we'll go ahead and set that back down. We're going to look for uh, additives, uh, you know, stabilizers, uh, burn control agents, anything that makes sense in gunpowder. And go ahead and run our calibration right here. And now we're done. We'll go ahead and close the file and see what it, what it did for us. Okay, put the dart back on standby. And go ahead and open up the uh, search from list program. Which is right here. Now let's open up the data file. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, we haven't uh, we haven't opened the data file yet. Let's do that. Uh, here we go. And we'll let the software go ahead and calibrate everything. Okay. Now uh, here's our gunpowder spectrum right here. We'll just go ahead and average over a few seconds and background subtract. Now let's save this file and then ask the computer to tell us what it found. We'll put it in the same directory with, as all the other spectra. And then open up the spectrum. There we go. Now let's give this a list of uh, uh, things that might be in gunpowders. We should have a list of uh, smokeless powder components. We'll go ahead and load the file. It's got things like uh, dinitrotoluene and uh, diphenylamine and all that kind of thing in it. All right, now let's uh, search the spectrum and see what we found. Two things showed up. Let's make the labels a little bigger so you can see them. What they were were diphenylamine and ethyl centralite. And both of these are well-known additives in, in gunpowder. So we've got a fingerprint of the, the additives in the, the gunpowder that can be used together with other information such as morphology or infrared to uh, identify which gunpowder particle we're looking at. Remember, this is just a tiny little gunpowder particle, but we've been able to identify quickly what the two components are in it. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and uh, try something different. We'll go ahead and uh, look at some explosives in a standard mix. To do this, I'm going to switch to negative ion mode. And what we're doing is loading uh, a fairly old cal uh, instrument tune file from about a year ago. Uh, tuning is very stable unless we change something in the instrument. So if we load the negative ion file, the instrument's going to switch the multiplier uh, voltage from plus 2500 to minus 2500 or thereabouts. It's going to ramp the electron multiplier voltage down slowly and then bring it back up again at the opposite 
polarity so that the instrument is protected. You don't have any sudden shocks going from plus 2,000 volts to minus 2,000 volts. Okay, now we're up and running, and the dart goes back on. We'll just switch the dart polarity. That's just going to change the two low voltage electrodes from plus to minus. And now we're in negative ion mode. Let's take a quick look and make sure that we're getting some low mass peaks. Okay, the dart signal stabilizing here. We're starting to see uh, an oxygen peak at 32 grow in. So as soon as this stabilizes a little bit, we'll go ahead and measure our sample just a little bit longer. This is a typical negative ion dart background. It's mostly just oxygen and some uh, water and carbon dioxide clusters. So there we go. That's looking good. Now we'll set the analyzer voltage a little higher so we don't have to look at all those low mass peaks. And we'll open up a data file and save the results. I'll raise the multiplier a little bit. Okay, let's, uh, let's just call this explosives. This is a mixture of uh, TNT and high explosives like RDX and uh, HMX and a few other things their uh, dilute solution. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and run that. I'm just going to open the vial here and dip a melting point tube in it. Of course, uh, that's just because of the standard liquid solution of uh, explosives. Uh, particles or wipes or cloth could be handled the same way. Let's grab a melting point tube. Okay, we'll start the data file, get a couple of background spectra, dip the melting point tube in the solution and run it. And we'll put the melting point tube right in front of the dart. We should see a whole series of peaks. Now what we're seeing here are the molecular ions, the M- or the M-H for the nitro explosives like dinitrotoluene and trinitrotoluene, trinitrobenzene and so on. The high explosives like HMX and RDX don't tend to give a molecular ion under these conditions. To get that to work, we want to form an adduct of some sort. So I'm going to use a little bit of methylene chloride on a cotton swab uh, to produce some chloride ions in the negative ion spectrum. And we're just going to dip a cotton swab in the methylene chloride. And we're going to uh, pass the uh, gas stream just over the skinny part of the cotton swab so that some of the vapor gets into the, the gas stream. And then we'll produce M plus Cl minus for the high explosives. We'll go ahead and compare these spectra after we're done. Okay, so here's the uh, here's the sample and here's the methylene chloride. We'll go over here and just hold this in the gas stream. So there's a little bit of methylene chloride vapor there, and we'll put the sample in front of it and just watch what happens. Okay, that's done. Let's go ahead and uh, throw some polyethylene glycol in the spectrum so that we have a reference compound. I'll put the top back on this. Okay, here's our PEG negative ion spectrum. This tends to be uh, oxygen adducts that are being formed from PEG in negative ion mode. That should be enough to calibrate on. Okay, we'll go ahead and close up the data file. And put the dart back on standby. And uh, let's see what the data look like. Uh, that calibration didn't come out quite right, but we'll fix it. I think we will. Uh, maybe not. Okay, here's where I'm going to need a break for a minute. That didn't come out quite right. I don't know why. Oh, different, different peaks. Okay. Is that not working better? Let me 
is going to be a problem. There we go. Okay, um, let's see what we can find here. Okay, the initial, well, let's save both of these data files so you can see what we're finding here. The, uh, we measured this twice, once without the methylene chloride and once with the methylene chloride. So let's go ahead and save the file without the methylene chloride first. Save that to a data file and put it in the same directory. Now let's put a note on the file name so that it, we know that there's no chloride. And then let's look at the part where we did add the methylene chloride. Uh, there are going to be some pretty characteristic peaks here. Okay. We'll put that in the same folder. Okay, now let's, let's open both of these up. First of all, let's load a list of explosives uh, so that the software will know what it's looking for. This is only going to label peaks if the peaks are identified in the mass spectrum within the specified exact mass tolerance. So we'll take first the uh, no chloride spectrum. And we're looking at negative ions now, so we want to have it look for M minus H's. And here's what it finds. It finds uh, dinitrotoluene, amino dinitrotoluene, and TNT. Uh, let's have it label what it did. So those, those are M minus H peaks. You also can see molecular ions, so let's have it label those things if it finds them. And in fact, uh, what, it, what it finds is trinitrobenzene, dinitrobenzene, and the TNT molecular ions. So those are just M minus, and here are the M minus H peaks added onto the spectrum. And so we found, as I said, we find all the uh, nitroaromatic explosives show up as M minus or M minus H. But notice we don't see any HMX or RDX in here. Uh, those don't form abundant molecular ions in this mode. What we want to do is go to the other spectrum, uh, right here, and let's search that spectrum and see what we see. Let's look for chloride addicts, because we added chlorine on purpose. So we're going to look for an M plus Cl minus. And here you go. You start to see some of these things uh, like the RDX plus chloride and the HMX chloride at mass 257 and 331. If you're used to looking at mass spectra, you'll, you'll recognize the chlorine isotope pattern with the 3 to 1 uh, isotope ratios at 257 and 259. So between the, uh, the, the no chlorine and the, the plus chlorine part of the analysis, you'll be able to identify all the, the uh, uh, nitrogen containing explosives in negative ion mode. Positive ion mode will also work, but it's not as sensitive. Uh, negative ion detection for the uh, uh, these explosives is, is much more sensitive than uh, trying to run this in positive ion mode. Okay, now let's go back to something different. Let's go back to positive ion mode. Uh, let's open a positive ion tune method, preferably one that we've had uh, a recent one. This is just, uh, now we're going to look at materials. I want to uh, look at a, a piece of plastic from a coffee cup. Uh, let's see if we can identify what kind of plastic it is. So let's just rip a little bit of plastic off of there and stick that in front of the dart with some forceps. To do this, uh, I'm going to heat the dart up to higher temperatures so that we're going to decompose the polymer. With polymers, we can do two things. We can, uh, we can look at them at a lower temperature and find out what the additives are. And then we can raise the temperature and do a kind of pyrolysis to decompose the polymer into uh, fingerprint fragments. Uh, for example, nylons will show series uh, polycaprolactam. You'll see uh, you know, peaks uh, caprolactam times, times n plus 1. Uh, styrene will show some characteristic peaks at, uh, I think, 105 and uh, some other masses. Uh, Right now, we're not trying to get the entire polymer. We just want to see characteristic peaks that let us identify which polymer it is by its fingerprint pattern by comparing spectra with the database. So, we'll turn the dart temperature up, turn it back on again. We'll go back to positive ion mode and let it switch those two potentials. 
Let's run this at about 350 degrees C. So that's a little bit hotter than what we've been doing before. This is actually a destructive technique. It's going to melt a piece of the plastic. So you want to use as small a piece of plastic as you uh, can afford to use. Okay. We're in operate mode. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, make sure we have some signal. I think everything's on and running. There we go. Okay, and let's set up a data acquisition. Let's just call it plastic. Let's go to a little higher mass, let's say a thousand. Some of the polymers can give you higher, uh, higher mass peaks, and those are characteristic, so we might as well go ahead and measure them. Some of the additives are also around the six to seven hundred mass range, so it's good to have a higher mass range for this. Okay, we'll see the window open up. As soon as we hit the start button, we'll start collecting. Okay, there we go. And get a couple of background spectra first. All right, now let's stick the, the plastic in front of this. This also probably has coffee in, on it. We might see caffeine in the spectrum. We might see some other things. But I'm just going to hold this here for a little while until we start to see some peaks. Okay, now we're starting to get a pretty characteristic looking spectrum right there. Let's take that away. We, we didn't really melt the plastic very much, but we did melt it a little bit and run the, the peg spectrum just like we always do, the peg spectrum in the data file, so there's never any question in the future about whether we had a calibration for this particular sample. Okay, we're done. Stop it. Put the dart back on standby. We're not going to run anything uh, this hot again for a while, so let's just turn the temperature back down and let it cool down. Put it back on standby. And then open the data file and see what happened. It's positive ion, so we use a positive default calibration. The software finds the calibration, locks in on it, and calibrates the mass spectrum. And now we've got a characteristic looking uh, uh, pattern for uh, something here. Um, we do have a little bit of caffeine in the background at 195. You can see where that is. Uh, that's because this was a coffee cup top, so we spilled a little coffee on it. But let's take the spectrum, save it. Put it in the same directory as everything else. And then let's open up that spectrum. And we're going to try to compare this against some uh, uh, polymer mass spectra that we've previously measured for a few different kinds of standard polymers. So I'm not going to try to identify the individual peaks and know what they are. I just want to see what the overall pattern matches, not unlike what Roger is doing with the inks. So to do that, we'll uh, search a little database of uh, polymer samples. and uh, the software just matched this pattern against the uh, exact masses and the intensities of other polymer standards in the, the library. And if you look, the best match is a polystyrene standard sample. And if you look at the uh, bottom, the mirror spectrum, you see the 105, the 119, the 131 peaks, the 235 peak. All of these things line up nicely. We could lower the threshold and probably match a few more peaks. But the best match is clearly the, the polystyrene peak. If you compare this, the next best matches are other things that have styrene in them, like acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, uh, styrene butadiene polymer. And then you get to things that don't have styrene in them. You, s you see the patterns don't match at all very well. So we're able to identify exactly which polymer this is, and, and that's correct. If you look at the, uh, the label here, you see this is recyclable, and it's got a little six with a triangle around it, which means that it's polystyrene. So the software identified which plastic we're looking at, and uh, you could also identify other components in there if you want to look. You can see that the 195 is not in the polymer standard, but it a, a, a caffeine peak. If we were to look at that, we'd identify what it was. So I'll go ahead and stop there and uh, make that an example of uh, how we can identify materials by using DART. The same thing goes for uh, rubber tires or uh, white powders or cosmetics. Uh, by having a database of standard DART spectra for each of those uh, common substances, we can identify what kind of tire the, the skid mark came from or uh, 
which kind of cosmetics were in a swab uh, can be very useful in, in trying to solve a problem. Go ahead and stop and thank you.